Let's project a line into itself. Treat it as a range of points. Cast them through a perspective point into some other line. Then cast the new range through another perspective point back into the first line. Easy. It is a co-basal projectivity, returning the transformed range to the same line. Now in this example, the projection leaves the sequence unchanged, namely alphabetical from north to south. Is that always the case? Or can you rearrange things to produce a flip? Pause if you want to try it. Here, for instance, the direction is reversed. Quiz, what does that depend on? Hint. The two lines carrying the three ranges intersect somewhere. As explained in the presentation on metamorphosis, Two lines in a point divide the point into two segments. If both perspective points lie in the same segment of the point joining the original range with the perspective range, then direction is maintained. Otherwise, it is reversed. Okay, boys and girls, guess what time it is? That's right, all together now, time to polarize. Let's project a point into itself. Treat it as a pencil of lines. Cast them through a perspective line into some other point. Then cast the new pencil through another perspective line back into the first point. Easy. It is a co-basal projectivity returning the transformed pencil to the same point. Now in this example, the projection leaves the sequence unchanged namely alphabetical clockwise. Is that always the case? Or can you rearrange things to produce a flip? Pause if you want to try it. Here, for instance, the direction is reversed. Quiz. What does that depend on? Hint. The two points carrying the three pencils join somewhere. As explained in the presentation on metamorphosis, two points in a line divide the line into two segments. If both perspective lines lie in the same segment of the line joining the original pencil with the perspective pencil, then direction is maintained. Otherwise, it is reversed. Likewise, you can project a plane into itself. Treat it as a field of points cast them by way of a perspective point into another plane and from there through a second perspective point back into the first plane. Pause if you want to polarize this spatial projection. Spatial visualizations 
require more will. Start with a point shown here on the left in black. Treat it as a sheaf of planes. Cast them by way of a perspective plane into another point and from there through a second perspective plane back into the first point. Here is another spatial return. Treat a plane as a field of lines. Cast them by way of a perspective point into another plane and from there through a second perspective point back into the first plane. Pause if you want to polarize that. Treat a point as a sheaf of lines. Cast them by way of a perspective plane into another point and from there through a second perspective plane back into the first point. Or you can treat a line as a bundle of planes. Into a perspective line they cast a range of points. Into a perspective point the points cast a pencil of lines. Into a second perspective line coplanar but not copunctual with the pencil the pencil casts a second range of points which in turn cast a bundle of planes into the original line. Instead of the perspective point at the middle of the projectivity you could also use a perspective line with yet another bundle of planes in it. The point just makes it easier to picture. Pause if you want to polarize this one. Treat a line as a range of points. Into a perspective line they cast a bundle of planes. Into a perspective plane the planes cast a pencil of lines. Into a second perspective line, co-punctual but not co-planar with the pencil, the pencil casts a second bundle of planes, which in turn cast a range of points into the original line. Instead of the perspective plane at the middle of the projectivity, you could also use a perspective line with yet another range of points in it. The plane just makes it harder to picture. For our next trick, we'll set up a planar return in this horizontal line, mediated by the axis of perspective and the two centers of perspective. Take this point and send it through the one center to the axis, then through the other center back to the original line. Now what happens if you just keep repeating the procedure? Not long after constructing a octuple prime, you get into a traffic jam. That's what. There is obviously a limit 
where the line connecting the two perspective centers intersects the double range. Now let's return to point A and work backward. Another jam. It's like the one about the city slicker who gets lost in the backwoods and asks a hillbilly how to get to Hooterville. After ample deliberation, the answer is, you can't get there from here. We seem to be stuck in the inner segment of the line. Fine, then we'll just start in the outer segment. Feel free to tape on some more paper. In just a few steps, the progression passes through the infinite distance and returns from the other side. And what if you start right at the limit? You just stay there. The boundary point coincides with its own projection. This progression has two such points, known as double points. Ready to polarize? Fooled you. We already polarized. For our previous trick, in case you didn't notice it happening, we'll set up a planar return in this upper point, mediated by the center of perspective and the two axes of perspective. Take this line and send it through the diagonal axis to the center, then through the horizontal axis back to the original point. Now what happens if you just keep repeating the procedure? Not long after constructing a octuple prime, you get into a traffic jam, that's what. There is obviously a limit where the intersection of the two perspective axes connects with a double pencil. Now let's return to line A and work backward. Another jam. It's like the gate of the law in Kafka. You can't get through. We seem to be stuck in the broader segment of the point. Fine, then we'll just start in the narrower segment. Feel free to tape on some more paper. Same deal. And what if you start right at the limit? You just stay there. The boundary line coincides with its own projection. This progression has two such lines known as double lines. Such returning projectivities reveal the origin of counting and measure in morphological movement. The spacing, both of the range and of the pencil, is called hyperbolic measure. Georg von Kaufmann who renamed the progressional measures, called this one growth measure. It is a geometric progression seen in perspective, one of the double elements being an in image of the infinitely distant, and the other being zero, hence the traffic jams. As shown in the second installment, negative infinity is the same as positive. 
Since cross ratio is prospectively invariant, the same applies to the other pencil as well, of course, and to the other range. When the two double elements coincide, we have parabolic measure, or step measure. It is a perspective image of an arithmetic progression. Take, for example, the rail on the right in this railroad track. It is a returning projection in step measure. The points of connection with the ties are equidistant, as you can clearly see. That is, each is the harmonic conjugate with respect to its neighbors of the vanishing point. These four points, for example, are a harmonic range lying in the sides of a quadrangle. No need to polarize this construction since it already shows two instances of progression in a point. We only need to polarize the thoughts. Take, for example, the vanishing point of the ties. It is a returning projection in step measure. The extended ties are equiangular, as you can clearly see. That is, each is the harmonic conjugate with respect to its neighbors of the horizon. These four lines, for example, are a harmonic pencil lying in the corners of a quadrangle. This is simply another version of the previous construction. Sending the horizon to the infinite distance has shifted the arithmetic progression into orthogonal view. This suits our inherited Euclidean consciousness. By singling out the infinitely distant for special treatment, Euclidean geometry is a specialized form of projective morphology. Of course, you can also construct projections returning through more than two perspectivities. They can generate growth measure or step measure. But sometimes there is no visible double element. We'll polarize simultaneously, showing both a red range and perspective to that, a blue pencil. Here you can see traffic slowing down, but then speeding up again, and passing all the way around without a hard limit. This is called elliptic measure, or circling measure. It has no visible double element. Can there ever be more than two double elements? Yes, but if three projective pairs are identical, they all are. A special kind of co-basal projectivity is involution. That means the progression merely bounces eternally from one element to its projection and back. You can only get to Hooterville from here, and from Hooterville, you can only get here. Obviously, this is a simple harmonic figure and must be constructed accordingly. Hyperbolic involution, or breathing involution, is a harmonic mirroring. Spatial involution can also be a harmonic mirroring. Here, 
The black line at the top is treated as a bundle of magenta planes. Each plane casts a line in one of the two gray perspective planes. And thence, a plane, here blue, in the gray perspective line. And thence, a line in the other gray perspective plane. And thence, a plane in the original black line. Any magenta plane you might choose in the black line would be the projection of its own projection, because the configuration is set up harmonically. Can you see where the two double planes lie? Pause if you want to picture them. Here they are. Each of these two magenta planes is its own projection. Then there is also elliptic or circling involution. This projectivity, for instance, run twice, returns the original element. Given three pairs of a breathing involution, or indeed any progression in a line, can you construct the double points using nothing but a straight edge? No, because double elements are metric, namely zero and infinity. Can you do it with the help of a compass? Yes. Not you personally, perhaps. But if you were as lucid as the great Jakob Steiner, you could find a solution so elegant you would only need to draw a single circle, or a circle in perspective. Ready? Here the compass is not used for measuring. The so-called Steiner circle can actually be any conic. The idea is to create a curved image of the involution or other progression. To perform Steiner's double point construction, transfer both ranges into the conic by a perspective point P in the conic. Draw the cross lines. By the cross line theorem, introduced in the presentation on the theorem of Pascal, their intersections align. The line joining the points joining the cross lines meets the conic in the double points. Transfer these back into the double range. Wait, how do you do that? Through the perspective point, of course. Like this. Given three pairs of a breathing involution, or indeed any progression, in a point, can you construct the double lines using nothing but a straight edge and a single circle, or a circle in perspective? Yes, you personally, simply by polarizing. Ready? The so-called Steiner circle can actually be any conic. The idea is to create a curved image of the involution or other progression. Transfer both pencils into the conic 
by a perspective line P in the conic. Find the cross points and draw the lines joining them. By the cross point theorem, introduced in the presentation on the theorem of Briançon, they, are, they concur. The point joining the lines joining the cross points meets the conic in the double lines. Transfer these back into the double pencil. Wait, how do you do that? Through the perspective line, of course. Like this.